For 40 years, CNN has earned its place in the world as the most trusted name in news. I dedicate the news channel, the cable news network. From war zones. They're not just lobbing stuff at each other, they're trying to take each other's territory. To marking the most important moments of our time, going there and being there first. What we've seen here today, it's all a result of a conspiracy theory and it's playing out in the streets of the nation's capital. And now, it's your chance to learn from the undisputed news leader in the world, right in the heart of the Irish capital, Dublin. Introducing CNN Academy and University College Dublin's Masters in Journalism and International Affairs. An immersive graduate program, combining world-class journalism education with industry-led practical training and expertise. Discover what is impacting our world and how you can report stories objectively for a global audience. Engage with the very best of the legacy brand that is CNN and the academic expertise of University College Dublin's Clinton Institute. The Masters in Journalism and International Affairs. Your stepping stone to a career in journalism, politics or business. You have arrived at the capstone. Come and start your journey with us. Hello and welcome. I'm Professor Liam Kennedy, Director of the MA Programme in Journalism and International Affairs, an exciting collaboration between CNN and University College Dublin in Ireland. As our video indicates, this is an innovative programme that very directly links the classroom and the newsroom and will equip a new generation of journalists to report on critical global issues of the day. In order to provide us with some first-hand insights and what it means to work at the forefront of international breaking news, we're joined by Sam Kiley, the distinguished CNN correspondent. I'll be talking to Sam about his experiences and insights for the first half of this webinar. In the second half, we will outline the MA program in more detail. We welcome your questions or comments at all times. Please use the Q&A box on your screen. Sam Kiley is Senior International Correspondent for CNN, based in the network's Abu Dhabi Bureau. He has more than three decades of journalistic experience. Born in Kenya, Sam began his journalism career at the Johannesburg Star before joining the Times of London. There he went on to be the Sunday Times Los Angeles Correspondent and then the Times award-winning Africa Bureau Chief. His reports from Africa, including Rwanda, Zaire, and Sierra Leone's civil wars, won international acclaim. After nine years reporting from Africa, he transferred to the Middle East Bureau and reported on the Second Intifada and the collapse of the Middle East peace process. In 2003, Sam began a long and successful career in TV journalism, working with the UK's Channel 4 with its flagship dispatches program, as well as with the BBC and PBS's Frontline. Since 2010, he worked with Sky News, first as defense and security editor, then as Middle East correspondent in Jerusalem, and then as foreign affairs editor. Sam joined CNN in 2018, and he's since covered the misuse of foreign aid in Somalia, anti-government protests in Haiti, the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. He has traveled 4,000 kilometers around Houthi-held Yemen, investigating allegations that the rebel government was manipulating food aid to gain political power. Most recently, Sam has presented several reports on the devastating impact of COVID-19 in India. Sam, you're very welcome. Sam, you're muted. One of the Hello. first rules of journalism. Can you hear me now? <laughs> we hear you now. Great. Um, I'm probably much better on mute. There was a great story. Just, um, just, just, just to, uh, I'll, I'll tell this. I was at a party for the late, great, the last party that Marie Colvin, the late, great Marie Colvin had um, uh, in her London house. And John uh, Witherow, who's now the editor of The Times, who was then the editor of the Times and the Sunday Times, I think. Um, who we were all we we're old frenemies, John and I. And he came up to me and he he complimented me on my career in television, having moved from print, where he had been my boss at one stage. Uh, and I said, "That's uncommonly kind of you, John. Uh, what's up?" And then he very wittily replied, "Because of course, at the time I was on Sky, and, and we're on mute in every newsroom around the world, as is CNN. Just remember, your future's on mute." <laughs> <laughs> which right. is the greatest put he was right he was absolutely right we spend most of our lives on mute 
Um, <laughs> so it's appropriate that I start this this uh, little broadcast on mute, I guess. Well, we've, we've now got you on mute. You're now unplugged. Let's see how that goes, Sam. Um, listen, you, you mentioned in passing there you've worked across print and television. Uh, it, it, it's a little unusual, and, and it's, it's very unusual to do it with such success across a long career. Um, but can we go back a little bit? Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, young folks thinking about journalism as a career. Um, how did you get started? And more particularly, how did you get started international journalism? Um. Right. Well, very briefly, uh, uh, I, in my gap year, I hitchhiked across Africa um, on, uh, with a budget of five dollars a day. Don't recommend it. Um, survived it, ended up working for the Johannesburg Star for a year and then went to university where I read philosophy, politics and economics and then was lucky enough to get onto a graduate trainee scheme. Uh, myself and Boris Johnson were the two that got recruited to The Times that year. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a sink or swim. Um, experience there was no real training that's changed a lot now yeah. I understand um, but we were just thrown in the deep end mm -hmm. uh, Boris drowned and of course his um, career has uh, never recovered from it really um, and, uh, uh, and, and I stuck with it and then pretty quickly I went uh, after about two years I got um, I was uh, education one of the education staff reporters on the times and the Sunday Times offered me a, a super stringer post in, in L.A., um, which was my first opportunity to get overseas. I knew nothing about L.A. and I was very much a round peg in a square hole, uh, but survived it for a year before the Times. Uh, they are separate. They sound the same and are owned by the same person, but are editorially very separate, especially in those days. Uh, offered me the job as a uh, Nairobi correspondent. And since I'm from Kenya and was kind of knew a little, thought I knew a bit about Africa, um, I took it. And in a sense, I never lived, looked back. I mean, while, while I was there, which was started, I guess that started in August 91, um, I was also taking photographs, which were um, at the time being um, circulated through Sigma. Uh, then a, a, a press agency, a picture agency that no longer exists. I think it's been absorbed by Gamma or one of the mega mega outfits. But no, no, Gamma doesn't. I can't remember. Anyway, they've all been absorbed into something or other. Um, Probably Getty. Yeah, Getty. I think. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It is Getty because every every now and again I get a, a, a royalty check for sort of two dollars and ten cents uh, from some of my leftover pictures from Rwanda or something. But um, yeah, so that, that began my career as a foreign correspondent and coincidentally, if you like, as somebody who uh, ended up being a so-called specialist in, in environments, of conflict environments. And that's because mm -hmm. uh, Africa through the 90s with the collapse of the Soviet Union um, was in turmoil. Uh, and it all began for me really with the fall of Mengistu in Ethiopia, which was not my first proper conflict. My first coup was Trinidad and Tobago. Um, a, a very kind of nasty little weekend coup they had there, but um, it started in earnest with the fall of Mengistu in Ethiopia um, and continued apace over the next decade there. You, you referred to some of the conflicts that I covered there. Mm -hmm. um, and that of course was all essentially as a print journalist, but sidelining as a, as a photographer. Um, yeah. And then, mm -hmm which is very important if you're a print journalist because once digital came in um <clears throat> it's very you, if you want to lead a page you need a picture and if you're any good you're not where the agencies are so therefore there aren't going to be any agency pictures to run with your picture so as soon as digital came in I, i've been very very techy throughout my career um for two reasons one is it makes life a lot easier uh, faster and it uh, and also it's much better for you in career terms to be able to get a page lead because you know how to take a picture and you know how to transmit that picture albeit over an old-fashioned satellite phone and so on mm. um so i made a whole i made very i was very very um keen on staying as mobile and fast moving as i possibly could as a print journalist across Africa and therefore bullied the times into uh, either renting or buying me the, the right equipment um, at, a, at a time when, I mean, you know, and this is no joke, nobody had heard of the internet. 
Yeah. Uh, I can honestly say I was the first person on the Times of London to have used anything resembling the inter internet, which was CompuServe uh, back in 1990. It's interesting you're getting into technology. I want to, I'd, I'd like to come back to and talk about it a bit more because, of course, it's changed even more in the last 15 or 20 years. It's been an astonishing period, I think, to be a journalist in that regard. You've gone from an, an, analog to digital. And my homework's not very good because I missed out. You were a photojournalism on top, a journalist on top of everything else. So I'll go back and have a look at those pictures if I can still find them. I'd be fascinated to see them. Um, but let's take you back to Africa for a moment. I mean, and it wasn't a moment. It was nine years. Is that right? Nearly 10 years. That's a very long stint. I mean, um, just thinking about how you were covering the news out of that continent during that period of time. After a, a time, you must have seen, OK, this is where the focus is. This is what people want. I mean, where was that? What did you learn from that over nine years? Well, I mean, there, there are kind of there are sort of office political things that you have to learn. And then there are kind of the operational issues to do with what, what is a story and where the story is and then does it matter and, and so on. In terms of the office politics, nobody in the nine years that I covered Africa from the time set foot there, ever. I didn't let anybody come near the continent, uh, which did mean that seven years in a row, I canceled all of my holidays the moment anything broke out uh, and turned around and went back. But quite frequently, I got, I, three times I did it actually in the airport. So I simply went in arrivals and departed in a U-turn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um because i was very very protective of my beat because i wanted to sort of sta establish myself um firstly and then as as things wore on i was very genuinely concerned that people would get killed uh, an awful lot of my colleagues uh, and not from the times thank god but but um over those periods did get killed it was a very very dangerous period in uh, for journalism um but really if i'm being honest because i was very protective of of my patch in terms of the stories that unfolded um, they all related in some way or other to the collapse of the Soviet Union and in kind of no, in almost sort of, so, I mean, you know, the, when did I arrive? Uh, ni August 91, by December 91, the Somali famine, which was a systematically man-made, created, deliberately created and fermented famine was in full, full swing. And a year later, largely as a result of the coverage of Myself and, 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 and the handful of people, not a handful, actually, it was quite a big press corps in Nairobi, um, TV and print. Um, it resulted in a US led intervention in Somalia. So that was a sort of, I mean, that was a process that went on for five years. So you had a steady state of very extreme violence and chaos, international intervention with the Chapter 7 mandate on a humanitarian mission. Um, that is very often characterized as a failure. It wasn't, it was a roaring success in that it put an end to the uh, abuse of aid by the warlords and stopped the Somali famine. What it didn't do is rebuild Somalia. Um, uh, so while, whilst that was going on, um, you know, we simultaneously had civil wars in Sierra Leone, uh, sorry, no, Liberia before, then sort of Sierra Leone, grew in a civil war over that same period. We had South African elections in 94. Uh, we had the Rwandan genocide in 94, the US withdrawal uh, from Somalia and um, effectively in about 95, but it had been sort of deemed a failure by 93, four after the Black Hawk Down um, debacle. Um, uh, I'm just trying to look back now, uh, you know, I mean, the, the Angolan uh, elections and attempt to end the civil war there, the return to a civil war. And these for um, people of a certain vintage, like you and I, Liam, are, are, are kind of, you know, were great events in our, in our evolution as, as wannabe journalists to, to young people today, their ancient history. But Angola, the, the end of the Angolan civil war was supposed to be, um, you know, it was very important in terms of ending the uh, influence, malign influence of South Africa and destabilization in what we used to be called the frontline states, the backing of Jonas Savimbi, who at the time was a, an Angolan rebel household name. Um, similarly in Mozambique with similar issues were, were resolutions were sort of coming to a head. And most of these were all coming to a head because of the withdrawal of Soviet support for one, one, one or other side. Uh, in a lot of these locations. So um, these, these were all very big events. So in terms of kind of 
pitching the story, I remember people were saying to me right at the beginning, you know, why do you want to go to Africa? Nobody cares about Africa. The Western media is all racist, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the, first of all, I wanted to have an adventure. Uh, but I, I figured, and I was right, that people don't care about a place because they don't know about it. And that w relates to the office politics of it. it. Once you start educating people internally to give a damn, they will give a damn. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to sound stupid in a meeting. People are, 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 for all of the frustrations that journalists in the field feel about their colleagues in their, what, they, what we often characterize as pointless meetings, they're not pointless meetings. They're not ignorant people. They're not trying to be difficult. They might not know stuff. So if they know a bit, they will be your champions in those meetings. So as people start to develop an interest in a continent such as Africa through coverage, which you might have to uh, kick and scream and fight for uh, in the initial stages, frankly, I didn't because these were, I mean, Africa, Africa and the former Yugoslavia were the two biggest stories of the 90s, but none in mm. terms of, uh, you know, dramatic events and, and international affairs. And I ended up covering quite a lot of Yugoslavia too. So, yeah. Uh, and then latterly with the endless Middle East stuff. But um, the... So let me, let me just stop you there for a moment because there's yeah. a huge swathe of African history there. I mean, and what you've covered. I mean, you've, yeah. been there and you've covered that. One of the things that strikes me in listening to you talk about it is you keep counterpointing it with broader geopolitical change. I mean, whether it's the Soviet Union or US foreign policy. So are you yourself something of um, a student of that broader change as you work locally? How do you link that local and global? Which is very important for an international journalist, right? Yeah, I don't think there's any point. I mean, if, if, you're not make, if you're not making sense of it in a wider context, particularly if you're covering um, misery, which is conflict, refugees, starvation, whatever, um, then it's just porn. Um, yeah. It's just misery porn. Uh, and it, it's bad for the soul personally. Uh, it adds nothing uh, except for perhaps reinforce, I don't believe this, but some people would argue it reinforces pre-existing prejudices. I think that's probably rubbish, but, but the, what, what it isn't is, is, is a, of any value. If there is no point at all, I mean, and this is something, you know, there is no point in my view, uh, and, and no journalist would disagree with this, but it'd be quite interesting to hear from some of your students when they start looking at the different approaches to coverage. Um, there is a sort of element, um, in which uh, some journalists of, of ego will try to project themselves through the story of other people's misery, particularly their big heartedness. Mm. Um, I'm sometimes accused of being um, uh, apparently lacking empathy or whatever, because I'm, you're not gonna see me put my arms around a refugee or pat somebody's hand or whatever. I might do it off camera, but I'm certainly not gonna do it on camera because that, 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 mm. that takes away from the wider issues. And the wider issues are, why is this happening? Yeah. Uh, which plays into what can be done about it. Very often there's not much that can be done about it, um, but, but the why is it happening is what intelli intellectually excites me. It's very often very counterintuitive um, and it requires an awful lot of study. A, a, a really a really aggressive amount of study um, I which, that. I mean, which i enjoy I got, yeah I, I got that impression and i get it from your reports and also from things you've written you know as well on top of everything else but uh I can just ask you i mean what's what's your filters where do you get your news and your knowledge i've got a facetious answer for that that springs straight into my head um <laughs> the the <laughs> Uh, what most of my family and friends would say. Um, where, where do I get most of my what? Where, where do I get most of my you're, knowledge? You're, you're, you're study. When you talk about study, not just news, when you talk about you want the deeper background, where do you go for that? How do you get that? Well, well let me give you an example, uh, a, a, a kind of challenging interest, which, which was sort of relevant. So as we were all rushing off to cover the beginnings of the Libyan war and the end of what turned out to be the end of Muammar Gaddafi, because I cut my teeth in Somalia, which is by far the most complex environment of conflict to have existed since the Second World War, and I say that with complete confidence, um, it was a fantastic place to learn the trade because it is so complicated and getting it wrong will get you killed. Um, and therefore, there are lots and lots of questions that you learn to ask that other people may not particularly 
even think to ask, uh, particularly not in military and government circles. So, for example, when it comes to Libya, what I was very anxiously trying to find was anything, any kind of anthropological study, political studies, um, studies in general of uh, Libya's tribal structures and their religious structures or the clan structures, yeah. which 100% under, underpin what is going on in Libya. The West tends to try to impose, uh, and this was very much very obvious during my period of study as an undergraduate, um, they will impose kind of Western sort of almost normative ideas on top of what was going on. So rather than see, and it was also unfashionable um, to talk you know, about Kenyan politics in terms of tribes, everything would be in terms of party acronyms uh, because tribal, to re describing things as having a tribal background or basis was considered at that time um, patronizing or neo-colonial. It's just a fact of life, you know, I'm from Kenya, you know, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. There are lots of subtleties and nuances to be discussed within that context. So, uh, and what was not available to me on, on Libya, at least in the short time I had available, was that kind of matrix that would help me out understand the geographical and, the, and the, the, for want of a better term, the ethnic or tribal or clan dynamics that would be underpinning other relationships that were in play. They're not, you know, it's very simplistic to say it all boils down to one thing or another, but if you don't understand that, those kind of multi-layered matrices, right. you're not gonna be able to make sense of it and, and you could end up getting killed. So okay. um, there's both an intellectual and a physical need to do that. I mean, and, and where do I go for that? You know, I mean, nowadays it's the internet, but it's academic journals. Um, it's, uh, in the old days, it was much easier just to ring an expert and, and write, download their, their, their expert opinion into a notebook. We're all a bit autistic nowadays and are afraid of cold calling people and much rather kind of hide around on the internet and fiddle around downloading stuff. Downloading is not everybody a substitute for research uh, any more than seeing a book in a library means you've read it. Um, but the, 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 um, you know, so that is, it, it, it starts from there. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, no, I'm, I'm and, and, you, and you build out. No, but it's great to hear you cover that because it's one of the things we're very interested in the new program is to think about how we bring, um, you know, academic forms of analysis, you know, to journalistic forms of reporting and 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 understand how to blend those because people like yourself are doing that all the time it seems and and uh, there's there's incredible value in it as you point out. One of the things you said in passing there I thought was really interesting this 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 concept of so-called misery porn. I mean, a lot has been written about this and so on. And, and, and I certainly don't see you as a, a, a touchy-feely journalist in, in, in these situations. But nonetheless, you have, I think, an awful lot of empathy. Uh, I, I saw some of those pieces you did recently in India with COVID, and there was an awful lot of empathy coming off that screen. And a lot of it, of course, had to do with the very pitiful situations that we were looking at and so on. <laughs> I'm not trying to soften you here. What I'm getting at is this question <laughs> that you, you yourself led up to. You said something I found very interesting. You said you want people uh, to care by getting them to know. Uh, and it seems to me that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an idea of journalism that's been around for a long time, the idea of revelation. In other words, if you can show people something, they'll start to care. But, you know, we're a lot of skeptics about that idea these days, but you're still on site. The, the journalist is witness. That's still important, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you know, the, the, when I'm in the pub, there are two kind of, I mean, we always take the mickey out of each other. You know, I am not trying to shine a, shine a torch into the dark corners of humanity and give a voice to the voiceless. I mean, I am secretly, but it's not the sort of thing I'd say to my mates. Right. Um, it's part of the self-aggrandizing thing that makes my flesh creep. Um, okay. yeah. You know, yes, of course, that's what we're doing. Um, but I mean, there are lots of other, much less laudable reasons why one becomes a, a journalist. It's, it's a terrific adventure. It's great fun to tell stories. If you can't tell a story, and, and it's not all about, mm um the, the 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 moving and worthy side of it i mean at the end of the day what we're what we're part of is an entertainment industry we want to enter yeah entertain inform educate uh and many other e's that get attended to those those missions if you're not writing or making a piece that is entertaining to read or watch you're not going to get achieve anything um if you're, you know, and 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 that's part of the fun and the and the and the, if you like the, the craft 
stroke trickery, art, I think would be overstating it, uh, behind our uh, profession. Um, there are sometimes there are moments when you might make a difference, but I think it's very and above all what you know what I'm often what I when I try to explain to to sort of journalists what you know what's the headline here what do you say in a pub. What I want to do is is surprise somebody with what they know in conversation over a couple of pints the following day, having seen a report I've done or read a report that I've written when somebody's gobbing off about something rather ignorantly and that person could go well actually I saw this or I read that uh, and it's not necessarily the way that you're portraying it or I agree with you totally because I saw this or that what you're doing is arming people for conversation you know which is which is after all we're, we're, we're social animals so it's got it's got to feed into to, to all of those things uh, let me just ask you, uh, uh, the, the audience and students, uh, you know, please put some questions in the Q&A box if you'd like me to 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 uh, to to bring those into the conversation here um, with Sam, uh, because you know we are we are coming to the end of the conversation soon with a few more questions. We'd like to include some of those student questions for this as well as for the MA program. Um, Sam, we I, I kind of paused you a little earlier because there was so much you were covering in your career in terms of technology and how that was changing. You just got us into the start of the internet age. You were talking talking about the multi-platforming and multi-skilling that seems to be very necessary in, 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 in the profession. Um, taking us more to the present now, I mean, how would you say that the profession in terms of foreign correspondence has really shifted in technical and technological terms? You're a techie. What skill sets will the, 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 the young folks starting out, what are they going to need? Well, you got to, you, they're going to need to edit a radio piece, edit a TV package, and sub their own copy. Um, it, it's as straightforward as that. And and if you can do all of those things, you, you, your storytelling abilities will go shooting up. Um, there's nothing like, uh, you know, if you're talking about copy, if you're trying to turn somebody else's bad copy into good writing, you will learn a lot about how to write yourself. Yeah. And the same applies. Same applies to TV packages or radio. Radio is the one medium I haven't worked in at all, really, except as a as um, a voice. But mm. so, I mean, I you know, I, I don't think a great deal has changed. I think that there's an enormous amount of distraction of white noise and rubbish information. You know, my my principal advice to anybody wanting to be a journalist is, for God's sake, get off social media. Don't tweet. Don't look at tweets. Don't look at Twitter. Get off Instagram. Ditch Facebook. Get out, get out, talk to people, read books and learn how to tell stories. Mm. Journalism is not tweeting. 50,000 followers <laughs> does not mean you're a journalist. Writing a blog is not journalism. Journalism is paid for output by professionals, which is why they're going to study on your course. OK, there's a couple of good sound bites there we might use, if you don't mind. <laughs> Journalism is not yeah. tweeting. That's that's one that's going on the website. Uh, we have a we have a student here asking a question for you from Dominique. Uh, where do you see the field of journalism going, especially with the challenges presented by COVID? Uh, well, I mean, COVID, COVID, I mean, although it feels it has completely taken over the whole world, obviously, by definition. I, I, I mean, I, I, I it's. Journalism is already very decentralized because of the technological innovations, because you can do it from anywhere and file from more or less anywhere. So that, in a sense, has been an advantage journalism has had during COVID. There has been no let up in journalistic output because the technology has been there to, to, to cope with it. Uh, and it's frankly suited modern journalism. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference at all. Uh, CNN has remained on air. People, anchors have been anchoring from their homes. In my view, frequently looks a lot more interesting than some 1980s <laughs> studio. I'll probably get fired for saying that, but you know, another blue and white background on a generic TV screen. Bang! I'd rather see what people got in books they're reading in the background. But but you know, there has been innovation. People have been very flexible. Um, in general, in the future, there's a lot of people who talk very dismally about the future of journalism, actually, uh, especially when it comes to international journalism. It's quite a bit harder to make a good living, definitely, um, but it's not impossible. It's always been a very, uh, you know, many have a go at it, but very few succeed. 
business being an inter foreign correspondent. There are an awful lot of people who perhaps feel that they should be earning and, uh, and doing a great deal more uh, than, than they are. And, and in many cases, they'd be, be right in assuming that. But, but, you know, most people don't really peak or get to be full blown, you know, well paid foreign correspondents until they're in their mid to late 30s. I mean, some some of us got lucky or cheated or, you know, took a massive punt. And, you know, Anthony Lloyd, the very celebrated correspondent on the on the Times of London, very close friend of mine, turned up in Sarajevo with a with a camera in order to try and make a name for himself. Luckily for him, realized he was a, a, a crappy photographer, but he turned out to be a rather brilliant writer mm -hmm. uh, and is now a multiple award winning correspondent. But he just took himself there. He literally hitchhiked to Sarajevo in the middle of a war. So he accelerated his his career by doing that. Um, there will be others who are trying to do exactly the same thing now. Please don't it might get you killed. Mm -hmm. um, and some will succeed and some will fail. I mean, I don't think so. In short, I don't think it's a bad time for journalism, that there's more international journalism than there's ever been before. Um, and the big mainstream media organizations are expanding their international coverage, not contracting it, including us. Yes, it's, it's, an, it's a fascinating moment in that regard because there's so many challenges, as you pointed out as well. One of the things you just add, I mean, particularly for students listening, is that whilst there are, I think, uh, relatively narrow job opportunities to be a foreign correspondent in the way that you're talking about, there's, there's, there's also an awful lot of other job opportunities more broadly within international news journalism once we start to talk about production and editorial and so on and so forth. So it's a much broader field than, um, than, than, than the foreign correspondent. But your, 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 your career points to the changes that have happened there and I think that there is a way in which many, many young folks looking at international journalism do focus on a figure like yourself, at least in the first instance, as they begin to think about it as a career prospect and so on and so forth. So um, as, as uh, what, what one of the questions that come through here, and I was going to throw it up to you, is the obvious one. What's your advice to a young journalist today? Uh, first of all, you're not an activist. Tell, learn, to, learn to tell stories with humility and joy, passion. Um, read, read. If you do nothing but read, you'll be a better journalist or watch. Um, study people who, who are doing it. I, every day when I watch TV, I'll throw cans at it if it's rubbish. And then I'll see somebody who's done, come up with some new innovation, some lovely turn of phrase, a trick of, the, a trick of editing that it will enlighten me and give me permission to experiment and myself and uh, uh, and continue to learn that's 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 the fun part of it mm. um don't expect to become a foreign correspondent overnight um the world doesn't owe you a living it's uh, i make light of how relatively easy it is it's not uh and a great deal of it depends on luck and above all make your luck you know the more hooks in the water the more fish you'll catch um, it goes back to sort of, I don't know if it's even a true quote, but, you know, Napoleon doesn't want good journal, uh, generals, he wants lucky ones. In this, in every walk of life, you make your luck, um, make your luck, uh, and then you make your luck by working bloody hard. Okay, I think that's a really good place to close, Sam. You've been very <laughs> generous with your time and your insights. We appreciate it as uh, we take this program forward, and, and we hope to see you in Dublin someday. Love to. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks again. And now I'm going to pass over to um, my CNN colleague, Ali Reza. Ali, are you with us? I am indeed. Yes. OK, so yeah. we're going to move on and uh, talk a little bit about the master's program. Um, this program has been put together by CNN Academy, which is headed here by Ali, who's going to tell us a bit about that, um, in conjunction with the Clinton Institute um, at University College Dublin, which I direct in Dublin. So, Ali, could you tell us a little, well, first of all, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your own CNN background, and then about the program. Sure, sure thing. So um, uh, I actually have had the uh, pleasure of working with Sam uh, while we were both at uh, CNN uh, Abu Dhabi uh, for a number of years. Uh, and there I was the executive producer of 
um, one of our flagship shows there called uh, Connect the World with Becky Anderson, um, which uh, is uh, the sort of program that, um, you know, covers a lot of the region, um, not only in the Middle East, but Africa, um, and, and really sort of uh, brings a global perspective to, to CNN's uh, lineup each day. So uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Sam and working with him on, on, on certain stories. Um, and now I'm, I'm sort of leading up this uh, CNN Academy project for uh, CNN, and, and it's really our um, foray into um, sort of uh, the world of education. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a new, exciting adventure for us. Uh, but, you know, we at CNN, we believe journalism matters, and uh, we've been sort of helping uh, a lot of our partners uh, for, for years to sort of um, uh, take on board our best practices, what's working for us in terms of production, in terms of uh, being in the field. Um, and, you know, since 1989, really, what we've had is this legacy of, of training our affiliate partners. More than 1,200 have gone through a CNN fellowship program uh, where they've met with and engaged with CNN um, journalists and producers and, and, and various other talent um, at our headquarters in Atlanta. And now what we're doing is we're building on top of that legacy of, of training and, and media consultancy and media uh, uh, knowledge sharing uh, and really bringing that into the um, sort of discussions that we we're having with um, sort of uh, university partners such as University of College Dublin. Um, you know, a lot of recent reports have indicated that students who manage to get their first job in the news industry um, are predominantly those who've had some sort of work experience. They've either had an internship, they've had some sort of hands-on training in a newsroom um, before they, they manage to land that um, all-important first job um, to build their career. And as, as Sam was alluding to, those sort of early things that you do in a career are, are super important and, 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 and you know, really determine where you go next as well. Um, what we're trying to do is we're hoping to marry up the practical knowledge and experience of CNN and provide students those practical sort of experiences in the classroom at University College Dublin to really sort of marry up the, um, the sort of expertise of uh, CNN journalists with the academic rigor of University College Dublin. Um, so throughout the program, uh, what uh, CNN will be there in the classroom on a weekly basis. We will be, um, colleagues of mine such as Sam will be coming in to Dublin either in person or virtually. They will present workshops um, about certain, you know, various different topics that we are grappling with in the newsroom, be it, you know, how do you launch a podcast? How do you launch a newsletter? Um, should you get on TikTok uh, as a news organization? What should your social story tell me? I know Sam is, it was, was recommending all of us to get off social media. Um, and and I, I think there's merits to what he's saying, but of course we also realize that uh, in today's media ecosystem, social storytelling is as important as being able to do a um, very strong written piece or investigative reporting. Um, so really what we're trying to do with this program is to bring those skills bring that knowledge and introduce it into um, the, the classroom and help students understand what are the tools and skills that our journalists are using today, not some sort of, you know, theoretical perspective, but really practical knowledge. And then on top of that, Liam, you have the, uh, the, the brilliant addition of, of uh, academic uh, training that the Clinton Institute will provide. Absolutely. And I think for me, certainly as an academic, that's the most exciting aspect of this is to be working so closely with people like yourself and your colleagues in CNN. Uh, you know, this is not a program where, you know, a, a large news organization has hung a sign on an academic program and walked away. This is hands on, you know, CNN are in the classroom, uh, you know, so they're doing 50 percent of the teaching and training, you know, not two percent. Uh, and that that's quite remarkable. That's uh, that's not something I think you're going to find elsewhere. So there's incredible access in that regard. Um, there's a lot of experience been brought into this. Uh, but as Ali says, of course, we have the academic wing of that as well. And that comes through the Clinton Institute that comes through University College Dublin. Um, and, and, and that ranges from, you know, expertise in, in um, 
uh, international affairs, foreign policy issues, geopolitics, uh, those big contexts that Sam Kiley was talking about, that a journalist needs to be able to grasp, to know how to pitch a story, to know, to know what the story is in the first instance. Um, and, and I think that's becoming ever more important in the interconnected uh, world that we want to report on, that we really, really want to understand. Um, and we want students to come forward who have that desire to comment on the world around them, uh, a desire not just to understand it, but also to tell other people about it uh, and to learn how to tell the stories. Um, Ali, you've brought us up now to um, a little bit of the sense of the journey that we're going to get. Do you want to comment on that? Well, I mean, one thing that, you know, um, and I promise I hadn't coordinated this with Sam beforehand, but one thing that he did mention was, you know, when you asked him, what are the tips that you might have for, for incoming journalists? And he said, well, you need to know how to, you know, um, produce a radio piece and, you know, a podcast. You need to know how to produce a video store. You need to write, you need to, and really, um, you know, you can't, um, in today's world, when you're walking into a newsroom, uh, if you want to work in the media, you need to have uh, an understanding understanding of all these different mediums uh, and the production of these mediums that, that are taking place. So really what we're doing with this program is um, learn from CNN experts, get the academic training about understanding the world and how you can critically analyze the world, but then engage with the CNN talent and the content that CNN will make available to you with the sort of access that you will have to CNN news source and others, and then apply all of that into producing content. Um, and uh, while you're getting sort of CNN feedback and, and, and supervision. So, um, and even with the multi um, sort of, when, when we look at the overall journey, at the end of the course, students have the opportunity to um, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of submit a multimedia thesis that I know Liam, you'd want to talk about as well. But that multimedia thesis is exactly um, a sort of storytelling project that you would be expected to do inside a newsroom such as CNN. So you need to identify a story, pitch that story to a CNN panel, um, get it approved, then go out and produce it um, and come back and, and sort of work with the CNN team, get feedback and finalize it. And then the best multimedia projects or theses at the end of the course um, uh, also have the option and opportunity to feature on CNN platforms. So, so really we want to, we, we want to create and design an entire process that, um, uh, gives you the most, uh, sort of, uh, real life experience in the newsroom. Um, just looking here for questions, there's one that's come in from Sophie, uh, from the elaboration about the program, it looks more like a series of workshops on a master's program. Can you clarify how many courses in the master's are made of how many hours will be offered per course? Um, oh, then <laughs> Sophie then adds, I had my question early, I can now see the details on the screen, thank you. But nonetheless, I think it's worth clarifying that a little bit. Uh, where we have on the screen now, what we have on the screen now is a breakdown of the, um, uh, the structure of the course and, and the timeline. So we break into three trimesters, right? So the first one will run from January of next year, and we should be very clear about that. I think it is on the website and any other information you've seen, but in its first year, this particular program runs from January to December 2022. 20, uh, so the first trimester you see here of 12 weeks, that runs for the first three months of the year. The second trimester is, is the next three months, and then you have um, a good bit of the rest of the year uh, to work on the very important multimedia thesis that's been outlined by Ali. So your modules, your courses, if you like, are coming in those two uh, trimester blocks, as you can see, and the, the courses are listed there. I won't go into them here, but if you're interested in the detail on those courses and what to expect on them, please go to the website. You'll find a lot more information about them. Just one I'll mention, though, and it's the one called research skills, because within that one, right from the first trimester, you already will be, as it were, working up uh, your, your thesis ideas. Um, and in the second semester, you will get a, a, a supervisor, a mentor to help you through that. And then you really start to produce that um, in the last half of the year. So those are the key component parts. Those are the key parts that are going to be accredited as, as you go forward. So we had a related question, which was the balance between the more workshop elements and other elements and how many hours are taken. So let me just say a little bit about that. 
the CNN Academy newsroom, uh, the uh, uh, modules which are running both semesters, where you're having uh, the CNN personnel doing the training, uh, do, uh, coming into the classroom both virtually and physically in Dublin. Uh, a lot of that will be workshop and training based. The other elements will be an admixture of more academic analysis, but also with some workshop materials as well. In terms of the length of classes, the hours, a standard seminar would be two hours in length in a given week. It can vary, they can get longer depending on what's being asked of you and of the group in any given week. But that means that you would anticipate in a trimester of having approximately six, maybe more, but approximately six hours of in-classroom time in trimester one and trimester two. But let me add that there's an awful lot more time engaged in doing the work that's allied to those classes. And you also then have tuition and one-on-ones in terms of you know, mentoring and preparing your thesis as well. So that, that's the broad picture, a lot more detail on our website. And um, Zoe has a good question about uh, how important is overseas experience living, working or volunteering to a candidate participating in this course and going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Zoe, what we're what we are after here are storytellers, people who want to become storytellers and um, who want to become well rounded global storytellers and CNN Academy, we believe that um, through partnerships such as the one with University of College Dublin, we're going to empower the next generation of global journalists, global storytellers. So, you know, uh, living overseas, working overseas, volunteering overseas, uh, or, or in your home uh, territory, all of that adds sort of uh, perspective and, and sort of uh, texture and context to, to your storytelling and the way you see the world. So uh, I, I believe, Liam, it's for that reason that we've kept the entry requirements um, very sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, comprehensive in terms of we're not sort of drilling down on, on one skill set or you, you okay. have to have done sort of social sciences uh, as an undergrad and then this program is for you no you might have done engineering and now you're you're interested in shifting here and we're we're totally open to that we want and if you have worked in the media at any capacity uh you could also um uh sort of uh, submit journalistic work as well for consideration yes that that last point is also very important um i mean our 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 doors are quite wide open in terms of people we are asking to come to this, but at the same time, it's very competitive once you reach us. Uh, but we we are we are asking you to consider that application. If, for example, uh, you've been out of academia for some time, that really you know you've been working in a journalistic field. Well, fine, that becomes relevant. We'd like to see a portfolio. We'd like to think about what you can offer, and we want to hear your voice. So those doors are, as I say, quite wide open. So have a look, uh, have a think about that. Uh, um, but also, of course, you know, as 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 time goes on in that thought process, feel very free to you know come back to us, ask questions. We're very happy to engage one on one as we go along. So the entry requirements are on the website. Uh, one of the things we will say about that that's important that Ali has just brought up here is the staged admissions process. Um, please pay attention to that as well because you know there's a couple of deadlines that are important on there. We're we're staging the admissions because we 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 do anticipate this is going to be a you know fairly competitive course as I've said, um, and so our our first stage for application is the sixth of August, and uh, we'll you know we'll look at everything that's come in by then by that date at the latest, if not earlier, and we will make decisions on all of those people who have applied by that date. If we feel there's a need to go further in terms of uh, ruling another date, then we'll move to the 1st of October. Um, um, but we anticipate certainly by that time, we will have a, a, you know, a, a full uh, program of students moving into January of 2022. So uh, these sort of details, I think, are important to just a, a second look at online if you get an opportunity to do that. And finally, the fees and scholarship. The fee for this uh, particular program is, is, is set across EU, non-EU, wherever you are in the world, the fee is the same. It doesn't differ. It's 25,000 euros, um, relatively larger than some programs, but then again, competitive with others. It really depends which programs you're looking at here. What we feel is that it's a fee that is very much in line with the innovation and the quality of this particular collaboration that we've put together in Dublin with CNN and UCD. 
Um, we do, however, want to be able to help students where possible uh, uh, with scholarships, um, but those, it has to be said, also, of course, are competitive. There's a finite number, but you can find details about our scholarships online. Uh, the scholarship basically comprises a stipend of 10,000 euros, which can be used for, um, uh, you know, fee-related expenses or specifically for the fees themselves. So more detail on, on the scholarship, again, on our webpage. So Ali, um, I think we've covered an awful lot of detail there and probably zoomed through it fairly quick. We'll see if any more questions come in and I do encourage uh, students to please ask us um, uh, more questions. But we're, 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 we're very much encouraging applications from just about everywhere in the world because this is an international journalism course and it makes no sense to conduct it without an international student body. So wherever you are, we are very interested in hearing from you. Um, and, and we also want you to bring your knowledge, your experience experience of working and you know living in that part of the world into a classroom with groups of other students who are excited to learn about your experiences you know I think that what we will grow here is a very collegiate body of, 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 of people who are excited about engaging the rest of the world intellectually and as journalists and uh, that's what's going to start in Dublin uh, with the help of CNN in January. Yeah, and, any final comments or thoughts well, for us? And the, the, one of the one of the comments that um, you know I think we had a previous info session, and one of our other colleagues was talking about how you know, um, and and Sam was alluding to this as well. You know, there's an element of luck, there's an element of access that is required when you're looking into sort of entering the world of of journalism. Um, and you know, uh, the the sort of term the, the my previous colleague had mentioned was that you know you, you, your your dad's roommate in college could be the person that you know helps you land that first job. And I thought that was really um, a good way of, of looking at us at Siena Academy, that we are your, 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 your parents' roommate at college or your cousin's roommate at college. We will give you the access to a global newsroom. Um, and you know, with the work that you do, the 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 thesis that you 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 work on, the content that you produce um, with that CNN supervision, you will then have a portfolio um, that you can then take on to your to your next sort of um, uh, newsroom uh, job, uh, you know, interview or whatever, and and say, this is what I've been trained. I have the academic background, I have the practical understanding and experience, and here I am uh, entering the market. So uh, that is really rare to to be able to have that access uh, at that point in your career. Yes, and uh, one other thing I would add is if you do again get a chance to look at the website, um, you know, have, have a deeper look at the, the Clinton Institute there because we have a, a building that we are uh, really preparing for uh, this program. Uh, you know, we're going to have dedicated spaces for the students who take the program, dedicated support within those spaces. Um, and so you will have there um, the environment um, um, that will really help you understand what it's like to work in a newsroom, uh, to work within the demands of that. Um, so have a look at that space as well, because that is going to be important. It's also a space where we bring everyone together. And although we're in a large university, we're fortunate to have our own building there. And, and I think that there's a sense of community there that's going to be very important to this program as we go forward. And uh, very much looking forward to students coming from different parts of the world to make a start in that. Ali, you're, I think, uh, also very involved there because you're helping us equip this space in a way that's going to be very useful for the students, right? Absolutely, yeah, and, and I'm very fortunate to have that space uh, uh, in uh, sort of Dublin on campus. It's going to be a CNN Academy zone, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, and you know it will be your space throughout the uh, the, the year that you're with us, um, and you will have access to uh, you know your 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 colleagues, your working groups. Uh, but throughout the time that you're there, you'll have access there, and we're going to hopefully equip it akin to a, a CNN newsroom. Uh, so you will you will be sort of in the in the middle of of the information uh, sort of ecosystem uh, that makes this global family. Well, as there's no more questions coming in immediately, I just want to echo what Aaron has said there in the question and answer box, and that is feel free to ask follow up queries. You can do that uh, to Aaron and her team at international inquiries at ucd.ie. Um, and the folks at UCD Global will put you in touch with Ali or I or anyone else who's available to answer questions and queries. Um, and look forward to talking to you as time goes on. Take care. Bye for now. Bye bye.